This is a holiday week, right? And we're packed. Praise the Lord. Good morning. It's good to have you here. Satan is real, and he's the enemy of God, and he wants to destroy you. Welcome to church. <laughs> Some people see Satan behind every single bush. They see him behind every kind of sickness. They see him behind every kind of crisis. It's all about Satan, Satan, the devil, and demons. And then other people go to the other extreme, and they don't acknowledge him at all. They don't even think he exists. Don't ever even have a clue in their mind when something maybe goes wrong in their life that it could be having to do with Satan. But we're going to look at the passage today as we continue to look at the life of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, where Satan's fingerprints are all over this account. We're down to the last hours of Jesus' life before he gets arrested and eventually crucified. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn them to the Gospel of Luke to chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, we do have Bibles provided. You can take that and turn it to page 882, and you'll get to that passage. And also, if you don't own a Bible, please take that. We want you to have it, and we want you to read it. It's our gift to you. And I want to ask for God to use this time for his purposes in this subject that we're going to look at today. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Lord, we have carved out time in our, in our day to come and spend time with you in your house. And we come now eager to hear what you have to say in your word, Lord. We, we want to learn from you. We want to be like you. And we open up our, our hearts and our wills to you to do what you need to do in our life, Lord. And Lord, as we talk about this subject, which includes talking about Satan and the work of Satan at the end of your life here on earth, Lord, may we also uh, get a glimpse from you of, of what we need to be careful of and the protection that we need from you, Lord. And we thank you that you do that for us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke chapter 22, we are now at the very end of the Lord's Supper, and then we're going to see the disciples and Jesus go over to the Mount of Olives one last time before the rest of Jesus. And let's begin to look at this account, beginning in verse 31. Again, we're at the end of the Last Supper, and Jesus turns his attention to Peter, who previously was called Simon, and he says to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Satan goes directly after Peter. Verse 31 again, it says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. And Satan goes right after the leader, the human leader of Jesus' movement, Peter. It was of Peter that Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter was the first disciple that Jesus called to follow him. Peter was the first that confessed Jesus as the Christ. Peter was the one and only who got out of the boat to walk on the water to follow Jesus. And Satan goes after those who are leaders, who are influential and have impact for the kingdom of God. And if you want to have influence and impact for the kingdom of God, you need to expect that Satan's going to meet you along the way and try to, try to rough you up. And Jesus says these chilling words to Peter in verse 31, Satan demanded to have you. Think of that. 
When you read the Old Testament and you get to the book of Job, you see a story where Job is very successful and he's a godly man and Satan is with God and God says, have you considered my servant Job? Look how godly he is. Look how righteous he is. Look how he follows me with his whole heart. And Satan says, well, of course he does because you have blessed him and surrounded him and protected him and, and you've done everything good for him. Of course he follows you. And, and uh, if you take that all away from him, Satan told God, then he would curse you. And God says, okay, you can take those things away from him and put Job to the test. And Satan did, and he played dirty. We see in Revelation chapter, 20, chapter 12, verse 10, where it says that Satan stands before God as our accuser, and he goes before God and accuses the brethren day and night. Those of us who are followers of of Jesus, I don't know exactly what he accuses us of, but, but maybe say, hey, look, there's Mike. He's a preacher. He's a pastor. But look at the other things that he does that aren't right. He comes and accuses us be, before God. He's proactive in meddling in our affairs. And Jesus tells Peter that Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. And wheat, they would take the wheat and they would throw it in the air so it would separate the grain from the chaff. It's like God, Satan was saying, I want to, I want to separate Peter. I want to throw him up and separate him from his faith. Jar him. Mess with him. And we see Satan's hand throughout this last portion of Jesus' life right before his arrest. Back in chapter 22, verse 3, we see where Satan enters into Judas Iscariot. It says, verse 3, Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was, one, uh, who was of the number of the twelve. Satan himself goes into Judas Iscariot, and he possesses him. And not long after that, Judas is involved with betraying Jesus. And then we see here in verse 31 that Satan asks to, to sift Peter like wheat. And then... We find not long after that, Peter denies Jesus three times. There's no coincidence to the betrayal and the denial and Satan's involvement in it. Next weekend, when we get to verse 53 in this chapter, we're going to see that when it comes to Jesus' arrest, he talks about that part of his arrest is due to the power of darkness. And Satan is proactive in inserting himself into the most critical moment in the history of the universe, and that's the death of Jesus Christ. Don't underestimate Satan's role in all of this. Don't underestimate Satan's role to this day and what goes on around us. And Jesus' response to Peter in verse 32 is, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Think of that. Jesus praying for us. Jesus praying on behalf of what we need. But don't if you're Peter, don't you wish it was like a different prayer? Don't you wish the prayer was, I'm praying that Satan will, will go away. In fact, he has gone away because I have gotten him away from you. That's not what he prayed. He said, I pray that your faith may not fail. What an awesome thought to think that Jesus himself intercedes on our behalf before God the Father. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it says, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. In our time of greatest need, Jesus prays for us. Now don't miss this. Jesus doesn't intervene to the point of keeping Satan away from Peter. Instead, he prays that Peter, for Peter that Peter will not falter in his faith. When Satan comes after us, it is easy to falter in our faith. We, we begin to doubt the goodness of God. We begin to doubt the, the validity and the truth of God's word. We waver in our trust of God. When things begin to crumble around us and to unravel, we forget the, the good that God has done in the past, and our faith begins to falter. And Jesus prays that Peter's faith may not fail. And Peter says, I'm not going to fail you. No way. I'm going to be there through thick and thin, no matter what happens. I will die for you. I will go to prison for you. I'll do whatever it takes to follow you. Verse 33, that's what he says. Peter said, and Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. 
And I believe that Peter meant that with all of his heart. That's the kind of guy Peter was. He was all in, all the time. I will do whatever it takes. I will not falter in my faith. You can count on me. I'm ready to go. And, and maybe you've done similar vows like that, promises like that, where, where you just got to the point where you said, I'm not going to go that, down the path anymore. I'm not going to sin that way anymore. I'm not going to doubt anymore like that. I'm not going to hold back from sharing my faith anymore. I'm going to make a stand for you. I'm going to do it no matter what the consequences. And you make this vow that you mean at the moment from the depth of your heart. You ever been there? And then Jesus says to Peter, which bursts his bubble, verse 34, Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day, this day, until you deny three times that you you know me. That very evening, the great promise of Peter was going down. Isn't that exactly what happens? We make the big vow to God. We make the big promise to God. And that day, we blow it. The thing we promise not to do, we do. That day or soon thereafter. And isn't it just like Satan to want to get in the middle of it and be able to trip us up right away and to be able to discredit us and say, hey, see, you're not a good follower of Jesus. You don't really mean this. You don't really follow this. You don't really believe this. And, and he wants to minimalize us and, and put us over to the side. But Jesus wasn't done with Peter. After Peter denied Jesus three times, we'll look at that next week. Peter's devastated. And then Jesus is arrested and goes to the cross and is killed and is buried. And my guess, nobody felt worse about this than Peter. But then Jesus rose three days later and appeared to Peter and empowered Peter. And then when Jesus ascended into heaven, not long after that was the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And Peter is the first one to preach a message of the gospel. And then it's Peter who goes to prison on numerous occasions because of his preaching of the gospel. And it's Peter who dies a martyr's death. He went all the way with Jesus. Oh, he did falter, but God gave him a second chance. Jesus is the giver of second chances. And until we're dead, we have another chance to fulfill those promises that we've made to God. God is not done with you. That's good news. There's more here. And Jesus instructs his disciples and he says there's going to be things that are going to change now. I'm about to go to the cross. I'm about to die. Persecution's going to heat up. The trials are going to get rougher. And he reminds them of a time that we find in Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10 when he sent them out to go and to preach the gospel and to heal people. And he told them to go out, but, but don't you know, prepare anything. Don't have a knapsack filled with food. Don't uh, bring money. Uh, just, just trust me that I will provide everything you need. In chapter 9 of Luke, it was the 12 he sent out. In chapter 10, it was 72 of his followers he sent out. But he says now it's a new day. Things are different now. Things are going to change. The the reception that you received that was so positive is now going to be very negative. You better hunker down. You better be prepared. You even get two swords for protection. And then in that, he tells them that that, uh, he gives a prediction of what came from a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. We said that he was going to be you know, killed with transgressors, meaning that he was going to die in the midst of two thieves on the cross. And so he says these words. Look at verse 35. Jesus said to them, And when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said nothing, talking about previously. And he said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. Let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And here's Isaiah 53, 12. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And then he said, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. Meaning it's going to happen now. And they said, look, Lord... 
here are two swords. And he said to them, it, it, is, it is enough. He says, get, get prepared. Back when I was pastoring in California, I had a pastor friend who called me late one night. It was like 11.30 at night. My family was uh, already asleep. And he called and he said, me and another guy, we just flew in from the East Coast. And um, God told us we're supposed to come talk to you tonight. Can we come? I'm like, well, if God told you you're going to come, you better come. And it was kind of bizarre from the beginning. And, and they got to the house about midnight, and he said, hey, we're really hungry. Can we go get something to eat? I'm like, well, there's one restaurant that I know that's open, Denny's. It's always open. And so we went to Denny's. And then they began to tell me the story of how they wanted to live out Luke 9 and 10 and how God had sent them over to the East Coast and, and told them to not bring any money with them and, and no provisions or anything and just go and God was going to take care of them. And they went from place to place. They told me story after story of all this. It was really kind of odd and, and bizarre, quite honestly. Um, and, and then, you know, the check came. <laughs> And they said, you have to take care of that. I'm like, yeah, I, I caught on to that. I... <laughs> so whatever that means and all that, it, it's, it, this is a new day, Jesus is saying. You're not going to be received very well anymore. You, you need to pack your bags and have your money and even have some protection because things are going to get really rough. And then Jesus and his disciples go to the Mount of Olives. We learned in Matthew and Mark that, they, that he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there we see the agony of Jesus as he's preparing for what's right around the corner. And we learn from his example that when we are being attacked by Satan, we need to pray. And when our backs are up against the wall, we need to pray. And when we're facing temptation, we need to pray. And when we're about to face an incredibly difficult time we need to pray. First, is we should be praying, not going to a counselor, not going to a pastor, not, not going to a doctor, not going to a close friend. The first place we need to go is to pray. Because power to overcome is found in God. Not that those other people can't help, but go first to God. Look at verse 39. And Jesus, he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And a sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to, his, to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow and he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. We need to remember that Jesus is 100% God, but he's also 100% human while he's on this earth. This is real anguish. This is true agony that he's going through. And I want to give a few observations that we see from these verses. First of all, that Jesus prays to his father. Verse 42, he prays to his father because he's so close to his father. They have a very close relationship, father and son. You see, prayer is a conversation with God. That's all it is. It's not mystical. It's not hocus pocus. Prayer is a conversation. God is a relational God. He's a personal God. And Jesus has a personal relationship with him that's deep. You can tell a lot about how close you are to God by your prayer life. If you're talking to God on a regular basis throughout your day, I'm not talking about having to set aside time to go in a separate place or up on a mountain to go pray or to go in a closet to pray. I'm just talking about just because you're close to him, you're going to be talking to him even if it's not out loud. You can tell a lot about how close you are to God by your prayer life. And Jesus prays to his Father. Second observation is Jesus submits to God's 
will. He submits to God's will. Verse 42, if it was my prayer, I probably would have prayed this. Remove this cup from me, period. Remove the pain, remove the suffering. I don't want to go through this. Just remove it. But on both sides of Jesus' prayer when he's in agony, on the first side of it, he says, Father, if you are willing. And on the back side of it, he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Because he knew that God's plan was always the best plan, even if it's the hardest plan. And he submits to his Father's will. When you're going through a really difficult time, do you trust God to submit to his will, to say with honesty in the middle of that, I want out of this, I don't want to endure this, I don't want to face this, but your will be done over mine. Observation number three is that Jesus experiences deep anguish. This is real anguish. In verse 42, he says, remove this cup of suffering from me. And in verse 44, it says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. If you think for a moment that Jesus does not understand you, does not understand your grief, does not understand your pain, does not understand your suffering, think again. But the Bible tells us that he is a high priest who understands our very weaknesses because he's been there and done that. And then it tells us that his body was, was suffering to the point that his sweat became like drops of blood. Some biblical commentators think that, that that's a, a metaphor, that that really doesn't happen. That, that they're just trying to show by a picture that, that Jesus was under a lot of stress. But remember who wrote this particular gospel? Dr. Luke. Medical Dr. Luke, who was known for his precision of detail. And it's very legitimate that our bodies often reflect what we're going through. Mine has always done that over the years. I hate it. But it always has. I went through uh, two, I've been through two major crises in my life, and both times my body shut down. I, I had major anxiety. I had to get help. My, my body just reflected what was going on on the inside. Uh, when I began preaching a number of years ago, I was so nervous that let's just, I'll just put it this way. My body reflected that in advance of the sermon. You can think whatever you want. It was not good. Um, I, I never admitted this before, and I probably will always regret doing this, but when I was in college and I would, would date, um, I, I would throw up. I would have to excuse myself from the dinner table or wherever and go throw up and come back, and it was really, a, it was not good. <laughs> and uh, I finally went to the doctor and said, what's wrong with me? And he said, well, when do you throw up? And I began to tell him all the times, and he just smiled at me. and He said, Mike, you got nervous stomach. Notice, it always happens with a girl. <laughs> One time, it was right in front of the girl's dorm, in front of a girl I liked, right there. My mom said to me, hey, you'll know the girl to marry when you stop throwing up. <laughs> and that's my wife. <laughs> I say that to say that Jesus is in such legitimate agony personally that even his body is reflecting that, so drops of blood are coming out instead of sweat. He is in the deepest, darkest hole he's ever been in. And he cries out to God for deliverance from what's around the corner for him. Ever been there?
A fourth observation is that Jesus shows his high priority for prayer by his aggravation with his disciples' lack of prayer. Hmm. He's like, what, what are you doing sleeping? We find in Matthew chapter 26 that he, three times he came back and found them sleeping. And it shows the spiritual condition that they're in. You know, so many times when it comes to a really rough season, a really rough thing we have to face, we just want to avoid it. We just we want to numb the pain. We want to go to drugs and alcohol or sports and recreation just to get our mind off of it. And we don't go to God. We, we, just, we just want to curl up. And Jesus says, this is the time to pray. This is the time to get serious because the power of God comes through prayer. But then don't miss this. That God, out of Jesus' prayer, God sends an angel to Jesus to strengthen him, but he doesn't rescue him. Did you see that? Verse 42, Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Not rescuing him. Because God's will is for Jesus to go to the cross. That was more important to God than what Jesus was suffering through. He doesn't rescue him. He strengthens him. We see this also in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. When Jesus has gone through 40 days and nights of fasting, he's then been, been um, tempted by Satan. He's at a weak point in his life, and God sends some angels to strengthen him. This week, I've been in contact with a woman in our church who's going through an excruciatingly, excruciatingly painful time, personally. And in the midst of my study this week, I took a moment and, and just paused and sent her an email. And this is part of that email that I wrote to her. I wrote, I am working on my sermon of Jesus in the garden and him being in agony right before being arrested. When he was in agony, he cried out to the Father and asked for the cup of suffering to be removed from him. God's response was to send an angel to strengthen him, to help him get through it, but he does not rescue him. My prayer for you is that God would send you an angel to strengthen you during this time of agony to get you through all the pain. I found in my own life, rarely when I ask for God to completely obliterate the tough stuff before me does he do that. But he does give me the strength to get through it. And so I think we need to spend some time in prayer. And let's not walk out of here and just walk out of here. Let's, let's go before God in prayer, because I am sure that there are a number of people in this room. Right now, you're in a place of personal agony, pain. Maybe you're feeling Satan going after you hard. Maybe you're in the midst of a health crisis that's very scary. You're in the midst of a marital crisis that you don't know where that's going to go. You're in the middle of a financial crisis bigger than you've ever faced before. You're in a relational crisis like you've never been before. And you need to come before God and to be strengthened by Him. And so I'm, I'm going to do what I did in the other three services this weekend. And in all services, we've had this place packed. And I want to invite you, if, if you need a special prayer from the Lord today, to come up here. And you might say, you know what, I, I don't know, people are going to think this or that. You know, don't worry about anybody thinks about. Everybody's been through hard times. And this is God's house and it's about you with him. So don't worry about that. You might be in the very backstage too far. It's not too far. You might be in the middle of a place that I don't want to inconvenience people. Inconvenience them. They will be fine. 
They'll be glad to move for you. And if you even feel a nudge or a tug, should I go up there? That's not Satan telling you that. That's God who's nudging you. And so without even any further ado, I'm just going to ask you right now, if you need special prayer right now, you need God to come alongside of you, come right now. Just come up here and let's fill up these, these, these uh, steps. And if you're one of the first ones, come to the top, would you, so other people can come and come and kneel. If you, if you need to stand, then stand. But, but come all the way up. And, and if you're feeling that nudge, right now, we'll wait for you. If you're in the very back, come on up. If you're in the middle of a section, go ahead. Again, people will move. They'll gladly move for you. Keep coming. We got time. Yeah. Again, if you're feeling that nudge, please come up. And just make room on the floor. The steps are pretty much taken. Anybody else? It's your time to come forward to be prayed for. Don't, don't do it in your seat. Do it up here. Make, make this a time for you and the Lord. If you guys are over there, and if you, if you, if you want to kneel, go ahead and kneel. You don't have to, but you're certainly welcome to. There's a few steps over here that are still available. Anybody else? Oh, Lord God, thank you that we can come to you in our time of greatest need, in our time of greatest fear, in our time of greatest confusion, in our time of greatest uncertainty, in our time of feeling attacked by Satan. And you know every single story of every person who's up here. You know the intimate details. And Lord, we come to you and we ask for your help. We pray, Lord, remove this from us. Please remove this from us. But not my will, but your will be done. And if you choose, Lord, not to remove it, then I ask that you would send an angel to strengthen. Lord, send help from heaven to get through this incredibly difficult time. And Lord, in the midst of this, don't let Satan separate us from our faith. May we believe that you are a good God. Believe that you have our best at heart. Believe that there's hope for our future. Hope for our marriage. Hope to overcome the addiction. Hope to be set free from anxiety and depression Lord, send us help from heaven to strengthen us as we go through this time. And may we feel and sense your love that you're not finished with us yet and that you love us unconditionally. And Lord, we love you. You're the one that we can turn to when everything else seems so dark. I pray these things in the name of the one who felt anguish and pain at the depth of his being, who understands what it feels like to be at one's wit's end. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.